church, we invite you to worship our Lord this morning because he is here. The King is here. The King is here. You're alive inside of me. The King is here. The King is here. Love will never, ever leave. 
struggles that we deal with every day. We are not perfect people. That's why we come to God. And in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, lay your cares or cast your cares on me. So we have individuals on our left and the right that will pray for you. And if you are not comfortable coming up front, we do have an area in the back that you can fill out a card and we'll be more than happy to pray for you there as well. So thank you. Okay. 
God, we thank you that you are, in fact, a God that is bigger than our storm. Bigger than the things that we face in this world. Bigger than our trials, our shortcomings, our failures, our sins, our addictions. You are bigger. And God, we invite you. We receive you into our storm. And ask that you move in a way that heals the broken, that mends those who are weak. God, we love you and we thank you that you are a God that is bigger than our storm. And your love for us is greater than anything we can experience in this place. And I thank you for that. Thank you. God, as we get ready to look into another week, the book of 1 John, I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and our spirits and our minds to what you would say today. Communicate with us today. Please, God, whatever is going on beyond these walls, allow us to be attentive to your spirit as it speaks to our hearts. Allow us to be attentive to your words as you teach us to be the disciples, the Christians, the church that you call us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. See, first service, let me, okay, let me start with this. When it comes to biblical stuff, I'm kind of a nerd. Like, I like to really understand what's going on. Like, I'll read a book, a commentary. I'm that guy, that most of the time I'll read a book or a commentary or I'll watch a video and then I'll get real excited about the content in it. And then I'll find someone to share my excitement with. And very rarely do I ever find someone as excited about the content I found that I am. <laughs> because I'm like, look at this. And the, I can see in their eyes the minute they watch the video or they listen to the con or they read the content in the book, they slowly begin to fall asleep. <laughs> and I'm over here going, why are you not getting so excited? And they're like, uh, oh my goodness, so boring. <laughs> but here's the deal. I'm a nerd when it comes to the scriptures. I love to read commentaries and dig in and find out why God moved the author or what was the situation surrounding the author that God moved him to write the letter that he wrote. I love it. And so first service, as I was halfway through it, I began to realize that very few people are nerds like myself. <laughs> in short, in layman's terms, I'm saying that some people found it boring. <laughs> but that's all right, Noni. Well, I already knew it, so we got Oh. She didn't really. I just know I can pick on her and not worry about offending her. Church, I know it's not always the most exciting aspect of the scriptures, but we have got to be a church. I'm not talking just Grace City Church. I'm talking about the big C church, the worldly church, the, 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 the church, um, the body of Christ across the globe, we have to be a church, and if we're not, we have to become a church that wants to dig deep into the scriptures. We have to. We have to. We have got to be a church that wants to look even into those places that we find boring into those places we don't understand. 
Because if we <laughs> she said she's never telling me again. <laughs> because it is in those places where I believe we learn some of the deepest things of God. The deepest things of God. I truly believe that. And so if you're visiting with us today, uh, we are in this series taking us through the book of 1 John that we started last week. And last week, we learned about the person of John, the author of John, and who he was and, and what he was like in his early years, what he was like in his disciple years, and, and, and what he was like in his later years, and the progression he made as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ, as a pastor, the progressions that he made that ultimately influenced the approach he took in writing this letter of First John, as well as the other letters he wrote, Second John, Third John, the Gospel of John, as well as Revelation. So we did that last week, and this week we're going to dig even a little deeper. And this is where most people went. I saw one guy just literally just fall over. Ask me if that veered me from what I was doing. No. So if you do the same thing, just do it quietly, please. <laughs> that brings us this week to this place. What is the background of this letter? Why did God move John to write the letter 1 John to the churches that he oversaw? What was the purpose? What was going on for John to write such a letter? And it's very important that we look at that today as we dive into the letter of 1 John. Because if you remember, the last week, I'm not even going to ask you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you because if I ask you, I'll force some of you to lie. And I'm not going to do that. If you remember last week, I challenged you, or for those who are highly sensitive, I invited you. This side is not highly sensitive. This side is. <laughs> they laughed. No one over here had any. They're all like, not cool, dude. Okay. Last week, I challenged you. Last week, I invited you. To read the book of 1 John every week, read it all the way through, every week, once a week, throughout the duration of our message. And here's the deal. As you do that, I believe when you, the more you know the author, and the more you know the background, and, to know you, and the more you know about the purpose and, 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 and the reason that God moved John to write this letter, I believe the more in tune with those things you are at that time, the greater the things are that God can reveal to you in Scripture. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? The more we know about the underlining stuff of Scripture, the more God can reveal to us when we study the scriptures. Because we live in a culture, in a day, in an age when, when many, much of the church is reading the scriptures at face value, what they see right off the print, right, right off the page, with a mindset that comes from the Western civilization. And what we have to understand is, first of all, I don't know if you knew this, the scriptures were not written in English, okay? <laughs> They're translated from Hebrew and Greek, okay? And they weren't written in a culture such as ours. They were written in a culture completely different to ours. And because of that, we need to dive into the scriptures 
at the deepest level so that we can read them, not the way we want to read them and receive them, but that we can read them and receive them in the way that God wants us to read them and receive them. Are you with me, church, or are you not with me? Are you with me? I mean, I mean, if you're with me, great. If not, we can just sip. We, I, can, I know great places I can order small bite piece devotionals that have no depth, and we can just mail them to you, and we'll just call it good. You with me? We got we to gotta study the scriptures. We got to go deep so we can know not what we want to know, but what God wants us to know. And so today, with the 40 minutes I have left, we're going to look at the background, the content, the motivation, and the audience that the letter of 1 John was written to. I'm going to start with this. Now you got to listen, you got to follow along with me. Start with this. The church, the church is, has always been, and always will be a flawed and broken representation of Jesus. That is and should be totally dependent on the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the truth, church, listen, the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Are you hearing me? This is important. This is so important. In so many different levels, and you're going to, more I go into the sermon, you're going to realize why that statement is so important. But the early, I'll do it. The early church is, has been, and always will be flawed, a flawed and broken representation of Jesus. That is, and should be totally dependent on the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And here's why it's so important that we understand this. Because, church, the church, even in its early days, has always been a place where things happen. We, let, let me say this. We are used to looking at the early church in a way that we don't even realize that things went on in the early church. Bad things went on in the early church. Divisiveness went on in the early church. It is important to know because rarely do we accept the notion that some of the early churches struggled internally. You see, we are used to painting this pretty picture of how the early church used to run. And we always talk about things about how we need to go back to the early church. Listen, there are things in the early church that we don't want to go back to. There are times in the early church where there was divisiveness, where there were struggles, where there was strife. And John is in one of those places. He's in one of those moments. The early church struggled then just as the modern church struggles today. And as we begin our journey in the letter of 1 John, we need to understand That as an elderly, seasoned, experienced pastor and disciple of Jesus, John writes the letter of 1 John to deal with some of the destructive and divisive issues 
They have surfaced in the early church. Now, this is why this is so important. Because church, we say things like, we got to get back to the early church. We got to get to this place as a church. And listen, I'm not saying we don't. There is a place as a church God wants us to get to. But I'm afraid that our focus has become so much about creating and chasing after the ideal church that we have done it at the sacrifice of chasing after Jesus. You see what I'm saying? We want to do church so well that we chase after the idea, model looking church at the sacrifice of the church, chasing wholeheartedly, passionately pursuing Jesus. We got to be careful, church. We've got to be careful. God never intended for us to chase after this ideal church over walking with Jesus. Because the answer to our storm, to our hope, ultimately is not the church, it is Jesus. And one of the things you're going to learn in the book of 1 John is this, is that the early church in, some, in many pockets began to move away from Jesus in pursuit of the things that they wanted. Okay. It is so important, church, that we not chase after this idea, model-esque picture of church. Not to say we don't want to do church well, because we do, but we want to do it the way God intended for it to be done. And we definitely cannot sacrifice the pursuit of Jesus over the pursuit of our ideal church. It has to stay about Jesus The church has been, is, and always will be a broken place in the need of the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the gospel message of Jesus. And here's why. Because the church... As a church, we sometimes pursue, and we'll see this in 1 John, we sometimes pursue the things that we want to pursue rather than the things that God wants us to pursue. So during the, as we look into the book of 1 John, we're going to look at some of the things that John was addressing as he wrote the letter of 1 John. The first thing I want to talk about is this. The first thing we're going to see about this letter is this, is that John was addressing this. And this is where it's all rooted at. This is where it all begins. This is where it all starts. There were a group of people who had joined the community of the church that John oversaw it in its early years. And as they became part of it and they began to receive the teaching of the the gospel of, of John, what happens is they begin to misinterpret some of the content, some of the scriptures. And this is the part, this is where all the trouble is rooted. There's a lot to it, and it gets very deep. We're not going to get too deep, because I don't, I, I might be the only nerd in here, but that's all right. We don't want to get too deep. But 
this is going to be this is going to be deep stuff. This is going to be good stuff. This is where it all begins. This is where it's all rooted. All the trouble, all the strife, all the frustration that John is dealing with begins with this very thing right here. There were people who were in his community that had decided and had began to teach that Jesus, in fact, was not the Christ. And the reason they began to teach that is because they believed that God was so good that he would never, ever exist within a material place such as a human body. What they believed about Jesus was this. They believed that Jesus simply had a spiritual transformation that began at his baptism and left at his death. And in fact, he had never raised from the dead. This is what John is dealing with, and this is what he is teaching against. Because Jesus was not the Christ or the Son of God, and because he wasn't the Christ or the Son of God, and he had this spiritual experience from his baptism to his death, they were teaching that people like you and I could have the very same experience that Jesus had. In other words, they were teaching that you and I, apart from Jesus, could walk and with God and have the same experience that Jesus did, apart from Jesus. In fact, one author says it like this. He says, they believed, talking about those who were creating this false teaching, they believed that through their baptismal initiation, they too had received the divine sperma and been born of God, thus sharing the divine nature and enjoying immunity from sin. It was important for them, what was important for them was their own experience of God or their koinonia, their community with him, their fellowship with him. And human relationships were deemed less significant. Love for God, not love for one another, was a crucial matter. It was these people who, in the end, seceded from the author's community. Listen, they were saying, they were saying that we, we don't need Jesus to walk with God. We don't need Jesus. Jesus is not who he says he was. He is not the Christ. And this is what this pastor, John, has to confront and is confronting and is writing about in the letter of 1 John. So when you read the letter of 1 John, you need to remember to come back to this which is going on. Because if we don't come back to the purpose that the author is writing the letter, we have a tendency to read the letter and receive the letter for what we want to receive it for and not what God intended it to be received for. The next thing, the next part of the false teaching that John is teaching against is this. They had claimed to have an intimate walk with God but not through the work of Jesus. But not through the work of Jesus. So what they're saying is this. As they were saying that we walk with God, but it's not because of what Jesus did. It's just because God chose me. He gave me his word. He gave me his mystical word. He gave me Uh, He chose me because I am uh, an elitist. I am chosen and you are not. Not because Jesus died on the cross. Not because Jesus redeemed them. Not because God loved them so much that he sacrificed his son for them. But simply put, because they thought of themselves as so spiritually elite that God would speak down into their lives and only their lives apart from from Jesus. And you think to yourself, wow, that is really weird. Isn't that weird from today's world? 
Because in today's world, we still teach, and some people are still afraid to combat the fact that people are teaching and saying that there's more than one way to God than through Jesus. And church, listen to me. There is no more ways to God other than Jesus. None. None. So, Pastor Kenny, are you saying, like, the Buddhists don't walk with God? Are you saying the Muslims don't walk with God? Are you saying this particular religion doesn't walk with God? This is what I'm saying. To anyone in any religion that denies, and this is what John is saying, that denies that the only way to God is through the atoning sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on a cross, and you're receiving him as Lord and Savior, if anyone denies or teaches anything beyond that, is a liar. Is a liar. And it is a false teaching. It is a false religion. But this is the very thing that they were claiming. One of the other things they were claiming is that they boast that they were without sin. They boast that they were without sin. They would say, I am such an elitist. I am so close to God. I'm having this Jesus-like experience that I am just like Jesus. I don't sin. Once God came, I may have sinned before, but once he revealed himself to me, I don't sin and I will no longer sin until the, all the way up to the day I die. That's what they were saying. They were basically comparing themselves to the Lord Jesus and that they were perfect once they received this invite to walk with God. Church, listen. The Bible says that two-thirds of the world has sinned. No? 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 Okay. The Bible says that 90% of the world has sinned. The Bible says all have sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And our hope lies only in the Son of God the Father, His death, his burial, his resurrection, are receiving him as Lord and Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We have all sinned. Every last one of us. And they boasted, and they proclaimed how they were no longer sinful. They also boast that they knew God, but nevertheless, they would intentionally and unforgivably live in obedience. So, I know, it's, I know, the, the whole idea of Gnosticism is, is very complex so what they were saying is this. They were claiming not to sin, not being capable of sinning. And so because of that, they could go out and live life in complete disobedience physically. Because at the end of the day, they said the only thing that matters to God is the soul. And so if I go out and I physically commit sin, God doesn't care. Because ultimately, he's talking about not sinning with my soul. So I can physically go out and do what I want, and my soul does, as long as my soul is not touched, as long as my spirit's not touched, as long as my spirit's not convicted, as long as my soul is okay with, I'm, with, with, with what my physical body is doing, then God is good with it. And so they would go out, and they would live in complete disobedience to God without ever being convicted, without ever having a, 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 a broken heart about it, without ever seeking forgiveness, without ever seeking redemption, without 
pursuing the person that God wanted them to be, both inwardly and outwardly, physically. Listen, church, we all sin. But that's the beautiful thing about the gospel message, is that we all sin every day, all the time. But the gospel message is this, is that when we do sin, and 1 John tells us this, that yes, we don't want to sin. We don't want to go out there and live intentionally in sin. But the beautiful thing is the gospel is this, is that when we do sin, and we do feel remorse, and we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, and we move to a place of, of, of repentance, He, He, by Jesus, only through Jesus, will receive us, will walk with us, will forgive us, and will redeem us in that sin. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you come with a heavy heart, burden, a heavy sin. But I want to encourage you in this. Scripture tells us that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But the beauty of the gospel is that no matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves, no sin, no failure, no shortcoming is too big for the grace of God. Through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Last one is this. They also boast that they love God and that they live in the light, but yet they hate their brothers and sisters and their fellow Christians. They were telling people, hey, we love God. In fact, we love God so much that he chose to walk with us because that's how good we are. That's how elite we are. That's how spiritually elite we are. It didn't have anything to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with Jesus. God chose us because we are spiritually elite. This is what they're teaching. This is what John is having to combat. To combat. In fact, they said, like I said there, they said, we are so elite at the end of the day, what happens here in community doesn't matter. I don't have to love you because God loves me. I don't have to share love with you because God chose me. You don't know God the way I do because I'm better than you. In church... This so scares me because it's very close to what we know as religion. I'm better than you. I walk with God well, and he loves me better than he loves you because my sin isn't isn't as big as your sin. My failure isn't as big as your failure. My shortcoming isn't as, as big as your shortcoming because, because God loves me. Church, John, the author, is pursuing healthy, he is pursuing truth, but he is pursuing truth within the midst of healthy community. We, you will see in 1 John that we are called to live in truth and live in light, but not apart from healthy community where we walk with each other to the light and into the truth. To live it out and to be, and to be the church that God calls us to be. I walk with my sister, Noni. I walk with my brother Dale back there. With my brother Travis. No matter what, we can't hate each other and claim to know, to walk, 
or to love God. And John, I'm going to wrap it up with this. And John is trying to get them back to a place where at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. I'm going to read from my Bible. Stephen doesn't have it up there because I, this is actually, I surprised him with this first service. And it's just my bad on that. I didn't know if I was going to get this far. I knew I had to get there this far, this second service, because first service would have got it, and we would have been on two different pages. And that's just really hard for me. <laughs> first John chapter 1 says this. That which was from the beginning. That which is from the beginning is Jesus. And John is not addressing Jesus' birth. He's addressing that the fact that Jesus has always existed alongside God and alongside the Holy Spirit. He is, he is strongly emphasizing the godliness, the, the, the God that Jesus is. He is telling them, listen, Jesus didn't exist Jesus didn't come into, into existence through his earthly birth or through his baptism. He always existed. He always walked with God. He was always part of the Trinity. He was always part of the Godhead. He was always in community with the Father because he is human. He was human, but he is equally God. That which, we, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard John says, we heard him. We've seen him with our eyes, which we looked upon. And he says, and we touched him with our hands concerning the word of life. And there's some Gnosticism stuff behind that, but the whole idea is this. The word of life is Jesus. He says, in the life of He's talking about Jesus. The life was made manifest. It was made evident to us. And we have seen it and we testify to it and we pro proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father. The eternal life which is Jesus. He was with the Father in heaven at the beginning of time. And he is with him now. And he was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard. We proclaim also to you that so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John, from the very beginning of the letter, sets out to bring them back to Jesus. To bring them back to Jesus. He says, we know Jesus is real. We know he's the son of God. Because we, we saw him with our eyes. We heard him with our ears. We touched him with our hands. We proclaim the truth. And the truth is that Jesus is God and he's the atoning sacrifice to our sins and only by Jesus now can we enter into a relationship and walk with God the Father amen that's what John is bringing the church back to right there as he begins the letter church it is all about Jesus And anytime we make it about anything else, about you, about me, about becoming this idea church at the cost of pursuing Jesus, we are living in the dark. We are living in the dark, as John would say. We need to get out of the dark and walk in the light, meaning we need to walk with Jesus. If you're sitting there today and You're kind of wondering what it means to walk into light, in the light, to walk with Jesus. 
we want to invite you, after I get done here, Steph gets done, to find him, come and find Steph and myself. And we'd love to talk to you about what that looks like about what it means to make Jesus Lord and Savior and to walk with him. Because this is what I know. When he is your Lord and Savior and you walk with him and you are in this storm, he is bigger than your storm.